Hello, 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 hello again. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks once again, and as always, to my dear friend Paul Melia, who does our theme song for us. Um, so happy to to have have a fellow Irishman uh, contributing to the show in such a way. So always, always a good time. Reminder, uh, welcome everyone. Tonight's broadcast uh, brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app you get through Google Play or iOS. So please check us out. And if you're looking for teletherapy across the US or Canada or Great Britain, uh, the UK, or as they say, or Australia, please, please uh, reach out to us. Go to nocd.com or click that therapist button on the app after you download it. Free download, by the way. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, assist you. Next week, my good friend Chris Tronson is going to be on with us once again. Chris will be setting the record for the guest with the most frequent appearances on, on, the, uh, on the show. So happy to have him here. A little reading from Chris, though. We're excited to announce OCD Southern California is having their sixth annual conference. This year it remains virtual, so anyone from anywhere can attend. It is on Saturday, April 30th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, PST. There are 42 different presentations from 80 of the top OCD experts in the country. Each of the presentations are being recorded so people can watch any of the talks for up to 60 days after the event. Even if they are unable to attend it live, you can go to ocdsocal.org. That's O-C-D-S-O-C-A-L.org. For more information, including the link to register, or email them at info at ocdsocal.org with any questions. The conference is low cost and there is a scholarship ticket available so people can register at no cost if needed. Just email them. They don't want cost to be a factor for the conference. So Chris is going to be on next week. He'll talk a little bit about it some more. Uh, by the way, No CD is a proud sponsor of one of those uh, those uh, lovely slots of sponsorship that they have there for the OCD SoCal uh, conference. And, and yours truly will be uh, virtually presenting as well. I'm going to be doing my Don't Try Harder, Try Different talk. Uh, I hope that all of you can make it to that and check it out. So that's cool. Uh, let's see what else is new in the world and exciting. Oh, questions. Look, people have already uh, put some things in. Well, what do you know? Shocker. Uh, let's, let's just see. Uh, let's see what we have here on some, some various things. We're going to, we're going to change it up today and jump around a little bit, see what we got going on. Uh, let's see. Uh, is, all OCD fe is fear, uh, Shalanda says. Well, uh, fear is a big component of it, but it can be feelings of guilt and it can be feelings of shame as well. There are lots of, of things that OCD can use as its motivator. So if it you know, tells you to be afraid of something, you may check it for that. If it tells you to feel guilty about something, you may do some checking for that. Uh, there could be shame. There's there's all sorts of things potentially involved in, in the reasons behind OCD. So fear can definitely be one of them, but it doesn't have to be the only thing. Brian says, OCD ruined my entire life. And my response to you, Brian, is check us out at NoCD to see if we can potentially give you some help then through some great ERP therapy. Because I've met people who have said that, who after therapy have felt that their life has really turned around and we would love to have that opportunity to work with you. Uh, Tamia says, Dr. McGrath, what is your best opinion on the real cause of OCD? I think one of the uh, real causes of OCD is people's uh, difficulty with accepting doubt or uncertainty in an area where they believe they should have no doubt and no uncertainty. That is what really comes across to me for a lot of people is why there are problems with obsessive compulsive disorder, because OCD, as we know, is the doubting disorder. And when people, therefore, 
have difficulty accepting doubt and uncertainty. And OCD says, well, that's not acceptable. We, we must have certainty. You have to have certainty. If there is no certainty, then that's just awful and horrible. Um, the problem then becomes, I have a disorder that tells me that I can't accept anything that's uncertain, but I live as a human in a world that doesn't have any certainty. And therefore, now we're going up against each other. I want absolute certainty. I can't have absolute certainty. I must, though, have absolute certainty, but I can't have absolute certainty. And we're just kind of going around and around and around and around, and nothing is really, uh, nothing's really getting figured out, right? Uh, nothing is is coming to the answer that we want to hear. And therefore we keep searching and searching for, for answers. How does one get over the feelings of their OCD thoughts, feeling so real threatening for so long? I've answered this numerous times. So I will encourage you to go back and listen to some of the old uh, ones of these, but just as a quick recap, OCD has to feel so real or else it wouldn't bother you, right? So it's not about how do you get over the feeling of it being so real. Everybody feels that it's so real or threatening for so long. And the real, I think, thing instead of the OCD so real feel, the, the real concern is, is um, when are you going to accept the fact that that's what OCD does, but just because it feels so real or feels th so threatening does not mean it's true or real. I will refer once again to that book. There's a monster at the end of this book with Grover telling you not to turn the page. And every page you turn, he gets more and more scared and begs you more and more not to turn the page and builds more and more of barricade. And when you get to the end of the page, it's it's just Grover. That's the monster at the end of the book. And he's laughing going, oh, it was me. I was the monster. Okay. And, and that's really what OCD is. So OCD lies to you and tells you that it's true and it's real and that it's threatening and that it's awful and horrible. But the reality is that's just not the case, right? And when you accept the fact that that's what OCD does and allow yourself to live with the fact that though it does that doesn't mean I have to believe it, you, you do very well. But some people get very stuck in that and, and say, it's just too real. It's just too real. And I need it to not be so real. And there's where the crux comes in because I don't know how to make it less real feeling until you accept the fact that, well, it isn't real, right? Then you will start to realize that it doesn't you know, match up to what it tells you that it is. But there's a leap of faith that's going to be involved in that experience first, right? So, And can you be obsessed with being obsessed? I mean, an obsession is an intrusive thought, image, or urge. And if you keep worrying about if you're obsessed about something or being overwhelmed by that, I suppose that that could count for something like that. And your compulsion might be to check to see if you're having more obsessions as well. Remember, OCD can interfere with OCD treatment as well, too. So OCD will say, well, the only way to get rid of me is to get rid of me perfectly. And, and of course, we're human, so we're not perfect, and therefore we can't ever match that. And so OCD will always find caveats and reasons to stick around as well, too. All right, let's see. Uh, Lisa says, and jumps around a little here, so give me a moment. Uh, I usually know when I have an OCD obsessive thought, but I usually have a something. So, but I have a hard time getting over the anxiety that causes and resisting your compulsions. How do I get over the anxiety and not let your contamination, oh, not act on your contamination OCD? Well, you know, there's a theme here going on already, which is, um, how do I get over the anxiety and not act on my contamination? Similar to some things we talked about earlier. It seems here, what I'm, what I'm reading is people are saying, 
I want the anxiety to go away. And then when it goes away, I won't have to act on my compulsions. But here's the issue. What if the anxiety is a product of the obsession, right? And I do the compulsion to neutralize the obsession and the anxiety that I feel from the obsession. Now, if that's the case, the way to make the anxiety go away is to potentially not have the obsession. Here's the problem, though. I haven't yet figured out how to help somebody not have an obsession. Because what's an obsession? An intrusive thought, image, or urge, right? Uh, I myself experience intrusive thoughts, images, or urges, right? Now, my reaction to them is different than someone with OCD because you take that definition on that that intrusive thought or image or urge causes a lot of anxiety or distress in somebody's life, right? And then they do something to neutralize it. So, Lisa, if you want the anxiety to go away, the first thing to do is allow it to be there and learn that you can handle it. Because once you learn that you can handle it, it won't be so anxiety provoking anymore. And when it's not anxiety provoking anymore, then the anxiety has gone away, right? And then if the anxiety has gone away, what use is the compulsion anymore if that's the case? So as weird as it sounds, it's not about making the anxiety go away, like by doing something to make it go away, like diaphragmatic breathing or muscle relaxation or a benzodiazepine or something of that nature, so that you won't have to do your compulsion. It's about allowing the anxiety to be there and learning that you can handle it. And once you know that you can handle it, then you no longer have to do the compulsion because why would you need to do the compulsion about something that you can handle? Okay. And maybe that's where people approach treatment a little bit incorrectly. You know, I think a lot of therapy that you might be used to or see on TV or something is built around the idea of, oh, you're uncomfortable. Let's make you comfortable. ERP is our exposure and response prevention therapy is, oh, you're uncomfortable. Let's learn how to live in the discomfort that you're experiencing. And once you do that, you'll realize it's not so bad or awful or horrible or scary as you thought that it was. And when you learn that it's not so bad or awful or horrible or scary as you thought it as it was, you won't really care about it so much and it'll just kind of fade on its own. I hope that makes sense to everybody. That's what we're really shooting for. Love Over Fear says, Dr. McGrath, I'm in the maintenance phase of recovery. You're working with an OCD therapist. Awesome. Recently had a spike in depression and OCD. Happens. Any words of encouragement? Scary to feel I'm back at square one. Well, I don't believe you're back at square one. What I believe is that, uh, you know, there are triggers all the time that happen in life and there are uh, decisions to be made or behaviors to be done that are either pro OCD or pro what I've learned to do that isn't OCD. And once in a while, we unfortunately go down that path of the pro OCD thing. So maybe we do a compulsion again, and then we realize how instantaneously good it feels and how alluring that is or something of that nature. Just along the lines of, you know, drugs or alcohol. There are people who may be sober for a while and who then have a drink or use a drug. And does that mean that they're back all the way to square one again? There are some schools of thought that say that. I don't follow that school of thought myself. I take a look at, hey, what can we learn from this experience so that the next time that stressor happens, you don't go back to using the drugs or the alcohol again. You do something that's different. And I would love to have all of us follow the same thing in anxiety and depression and OCD of, yeah, once in a while, something's going to spike. You're going to feel something. And, and it might kind of lead you to feeling back all the way to, to oh, I'm back to day one. I'm starting all over again. I, I don't think so. You didn't forget any of the stuff that you learned. You just didn't use it in a point that you probably ought to have used it. So let's figure out going forward how you use what you've learned in the situation that triggered you this time that led you to not use it so that the next time that that happens, you won't be so overwhelmed and you will be more willing to go ahead and use what you learned in therapy. I hope that helps. And you asked for ideas of why that's been happening. You've been keeping up with your exposures and living your values and you're feeling so frustrated. Yes, it can definitely be frustrating, right? But, you know, think about too, 
you can um, get your oil changed and have your car checked out and everything's running smooth. And then one day you go to start it and it doesn't work, right? Something failed on it. Something's not working. Uh, there's, there's always going to be the chance that even though you've done everything the right way, something still goes wrong, right? Now, people with OCD, of course, hate hearing that. That's a, that's a big disappointment to people with OCD who want uh, more of kind of that linear life. I've checked all the boxes. I've done everything the right way. Uh, maybe I've done all the compulsions that I need to do. Now everything should go great and well. But it just doesn't work that way, right? There are days that just are bad. Uh, a buddy of mine recently uh, he's, he's 50 now, old man. <laughs> and, uh, he, he was bent over to pick something up and he, and he came up and he just threw his back out. He's never had a back problem in his life. And he doesn't feel like he lifted anything differently that day than any other day he's ever lifted anything, but he was down for two weeks, just barely could move with, with, uh, pulled muscle in his back. Guess what? It can happen, right? We're all going to get spiked at things once in a while. No matter how much therapy we've done or how much practice we've had, look at professional athletes who practice constantly. They still miss things, right? Baseball players get paid millions and millions of dollars to miss a ball seven out of 10 times, and we consider them fantastic hitters, okay? We're not shooting for perfection here, right? We're going for consistency. That's our goal. We're going for consistency. Uh, let's see. Sherry asks, what happens when you compulse versus when you ruminate? Um, there doesn't really have to be much of a difference, right? I mean, rumination could be the mental compulsion that you're doing about the thing that you're obsessing about as you think about it over and over again and try to figure it out. So uh, that that could be going on right there, right? Let's see. Tom says, Tamia says, how can I practice ERP if I work? The work interferes with my ability to do ERP. I work remotely, but it's still hard to do both at the same time. Well, to me, that that's something to work out with your therapist to come up with a plan to, to get it to go. I, I work with people who work every day or go to school every day and who still practice their ERP. So it can absolutely be done. And I would say whatever you and your therapist could work out together for a plan to make it work is what's going to be the best thing for you to do. But work does not exclude somebody from doing ERP. Proswell says, how do I identify, um, excuse me, there's some type typing issues here. Uh, the thought I get, the intrusive thoughts, so I can choose to neglect it when I choose to accept it it might not might not be an intrusive thought. I don't feel normal. I can't perform well. Okay, so I'm I'm getting something along the lines here that um, if if I'm choosing to accept that there is an intrusive thought that's there and it could or could not be intrusive or real, whatever, that it's hard to feel normal or to perform well. What I would hope for anybody would be to be able to recognize that. Any thoughts popping into your head don't need all of the attention that OCD wants to give them, right? They're, they're just not worthy of the amount of time that the OCD demands of them, right? Uh, and, and I can say this because many other people could hear your thought or have your image or urge and just blow it off and walk away from it or laugh at it and say, well, that was weird. Knowing that, here's what we do know then. Not everybody reacts the same way to the same thing. 
So when I'm on a staircase and I'm thinking about pushing everybody down the stairs, I don't put my hands in my pockets. I don't decide I'm going to let everybody pass me so that I have no one around me within a five or six foot radius so that I can't push anyone down the stairs. And I see it as just, well, that was weird. And then I think, oh, wait, I know why I had that thought because I've treated so many people who have had that, that kind of fear that, oh, yeah, every time I walk downstairs with people now, I think about pushing them down the stairs. Okay, yeah, just remember that. Okay, that's fine. To me, that's not even an intrusive thought anymore. It's just something that pops into my head because it doesn't bother me in the slightest. To someone with OCD, I don't ever want to take stairs. I'm only going to take elevators or only take stairs when there's nobody else on the stairs, right? Um, when I have the thought of pushing people down the stairs because I don't have OCD, I can feel very normal, right? I can perform just fine. If I did have OCD, I might not feel very normal and I might have difficulty with performing. All this leads to a simple question. Is the problem the thought of pushing people down the stairs or is OCD the problem? Is my OCD telling me unacceptable thing occurring in my head right now? And therefore, how can I feel normal or be myself or how can I perform until I get this unacceptable thing out of my head? My question to you, Prashwal, is does it have to be unacceptable? Or could it just be a random thing that pops into your head that deserves no time or no attention? That's where I would hope it would go to is there. Fleur says, I work in healthcare and have harm OCD, amongst other themes. I'm afraid exposure therapy will make me accidentally cause harm to people I care for. Well, um, if that's the case, Floor, then then we would have seen that already in all of the other exposure therapy that we do with other people who have all sorts of uh, fears about harming people purposely and or accidentally as well. And then all OCD therapists who practice ERP probably should be arrested if that's the case for encouraging people to be so harmful to everybody. Um, so though you might fear OCD therapy uh, will and ERP will make you do something, ERP has never made anybody do anything. I, never once in my career have I made anyone do anything. I've, I've always asked people to make the choice to do something on their own or not. Now, the second part of that, that it might make you accidentally cause harm to people you care for, I'm going to go with that's out of the belief that the reason you haven't harmed anyone is because you have OCD and only because you have OCD have you not harmed anyone. And were you to lose the OCD, then you would become a harmful person. And yet there's billions of people who don't have OCD who also don't go out and harm people as well too. Now. Fleur, would you recommend that I change my job and I move my job from helping people to get rid of OCD to helping people have OCD, to helping people gain more OCD? Because if your belief is that it is OCD that prevents accidental damage to people, then wouldn't it be better of me to encourage people to have OCD instead of help people to get rid of it. It would be like a an odd version of Fahrenheit 451, where uh, instead of firemen putting out fires, they start them, right? They burn down the houses with all the books in them. And I would be going around almost es espousing the, the goodness of OCD, saying, hey, you over there, who just seems to have had a car accident. I suggest you develop some OCD in the future, and that will prevent you from ever being in another car accident ever again. 
So here's some intrusive thoughts to have about driving and some rituals to do to neutralize it. And that will keep you on your toes and prevent you from ever again being in a car accident. I think I'd lose my license if that was the case. I, I don't think I'd be allowed to practice uh, as, a, as a psychologist anymore if that were the case. Fathia has said here, hey there, Tia. Oh, Tia here. Hi, Tia. Uh, you can't pinpoint your compulsions to a particular obsession, so you're not sure if you have OCD. <coughs> Excuse me. Your most prominent compulsions are trichotillomania and mental reviewing of past events. Well, trichotillomania wouldn't be a compulsion. Trichotillomania is a standalone uh, disorder. It is a body-focused repetitive behavior. It is an OCD-related disorder. So you would be treated for that specifically, number one. Excuse me. And uh, number two, mental reviewing of past events could be a compulsion. And I would just take a look at what are the things that trigger that. And uh, those could be things that, that have some relationship to obsessions. So Tia, I think your best bet is to work with a therapist who specializes in these types of things. We do that work here at NoCD, by the way, if that's something of interest to you. And work with that therapist so that they can assist you with figuring out exactly you know, what kind of therapy you're going to do. You would look at some habit reversal work for the trichotillomania. And in terms of the mental reviewing of things, um, you know, the obsession might even be basically around the idea of, of uh, what if I made a mistake in the past and I don't remember it, right? Or what if I said something and it was wrong? And, and so it may be very beneficial for you, according to your OCD at least, to, be, to review things over and over again just to make sure that you didn't do something like that, right? But, but definitely a therapist could help you pinpoint some of those things. MJ01 says, how, hello, how to do... I'm going to go with, how do you deal with avoidance and OCD? You all, you avoid always. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> very simple. There's five safety behaviors. Okay. Avoidance, reassurance, distraction, substance use, and compulsions. Any use of those leads you to feel worse in the future instead of better, even if they lead you to feel better in the moment than you were feeling before you did it. Right. So MJ. First of it comes, first part of it really comes to a decision. And to me, that decision is, do I want to feel good now or do I want to feel good later on? And if I want to feel good later on, then I'm going to work on the elimination of safety behaviors so that I allow myself to learn that I can handle the discomfort that I'm in without doing the safety behaviors. If I want to feel good right now, then I'm going to do safety behaviors and I'm going to learn that it is the safety behavior that allows me to feel good. And therefore I should continue to do all of the safety behaviors that I possibly can to continue to feel good. And it really does come down to that for a lot of people, right? Um, how do you overcome avoidance? Again, working with a therapist can be very helpful in this situation as they guide you through uh, response prevention, because that's exactly what response prevention is. It's preventing the typical response. It's preventing the occurrence of the safety behavior. So ultimately, MJ, we want you to learn response prevention. We want you to be exposed to things that are uncomfortable and then not do the typical behaviors that you would normally do in order to feel as good as you possibly could in the moment. Hey, wow, we're halfway through already tonight. A reminder, once again, tonight brought to you by NoCD, NoCD downloadable app. You can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out. If you're looking for teletherapy, we are available in the U.S. and in Canada and in the U.K. and Australia as well. And we have openings for you, so come and check us out. And uh, also, just a reminder, if you're, you're looking for something fun to do next Saturday, well, one of those things is going to be the OCD Southern California 6th uh, Annual Conference, and it is virtual. And if you want more information on that, you can go to OCDSoCal, OCDSOCAL.org, or you can email them at info at OCDSoCal.org with any questions. 
There is a cost for the conference. It is a low cost, but don't let cost get in the way because there are scholarships available too if cost is an issue for you. There's over 42 different presentations from over 80 of the top OCD therapists in the country, and it goes on April 30th from 9 to 6 PST. No CD is a sponsor. Uh, I should let you know of that conference. We're excited to be there. And yours truly will be uh, speaking at it as well, doing my almost world famous Don't Try Harder, Try Different talk. So uh, love to have you there. Please check us out. Rodion, I'm going to go with. Uh, I ruminate about the past due to real event OCD. Uh, maladaptively daydream about revenge based on this past. But what would you advise to do? Just let go of the past and not be trapped of it. Uh, well, it's it's sure hard to let go of the past. I mean, believe me, there's there's people in my past that uh, you know now and then. Now that you've brought this question up, they've all popped back into my head. And there's there's a few of them that, uh, you know, re revenge was thought on for many, many a year. But uh, what I did just, you know, I'll get kind of personal here. What what I did in that kind of situation was was decide that by spending so much time thinking about those people, I was allowing those people to not only have have harmed me in the moment that they did, but also to continuously harm me by me giving the control of my life over to them and me spending so much time thinking about them and what's going on in their life that I wasn't really living my life. And, and I just, I just didn't find it worthwhile anymore. And so I made uh, some conscious decisions that every time they popped in my head, I would say, yep, that happened kind of what it was that's the way that it was and uh, it's it's time for me to move on and live my life and and it it could very well be one of the reasons I do what I do actually um you know I I had I had some bullying back in grade school um in in and I've shared this on here before but in in fact one one kid in my class who who thought that um yeah, you know, maybe it would be fun just to uh, kick the crap out of me and pour a can of tear gas in my face uh, one one day, and and that happened, right? And and believe me, there was a a long long uh, list of revenge ideas that I had in my head uh, about that very thing. Uh, I, I have never done that, and and I can say that that person no longer has any influence on my life whatsoever though they did for several years and i was i spent a lot of high school you know developing amazing friends and having great relationships but also with kind of an undercurrent of anger in in my high school years for for the first couple of years in high school uh and, and probably a bit of a quick irish temper going on there as well too uh with with this notion that I really just had to protect myself from anything like that ever happening again and always on guard. And, and, and I look back now and I, I kind of regret that a little bit that, that, um, that, that I, I didn't fully enjoy everything that I could have because there was this, this bit of a, a guard up, but, you know, we've talked about people who've experienced traumas or difficult situations. And sometimes people live in, in a bit of a neutral to pissed off kind of, kind of era or, or way of being as, as a way to keep some of that guard up to make sure that nothing bad's going to happen to them or their loved ones or something of that nature. So, um, you know, that person from grade school has zero influence on my life anymore. Uh, and, um, they, they rarely come up other in maybe in situations like this where there's a reminder of it, but otherwise, I haven't thought of that person for, for quite a long time, actually. And even though they're, they're back in my head right now, I, I, uh, they're going to be like my tinnitus, right? They're going to fade back into the background, uh, later on this evening. And they're going to go back into their little, uh, you mean nothing to me kind of vault that that's in the back of my head somewhere. Uh, they'll never be gone. They'll, they'll always be there, but they, they don't have to have any influence on me whatsoever. Um, and uh, I, I'm in a way glad that I didn't spend all sorts of time actually doing any kind of revenge because then that could have led to something else, which led to something else. And, 
And uh, I also don't look at it like some people with OCD who have kind of, you remember it's the fight, flight, or freeze response. Some people have kind of the fight response uh, that goes on with things as well too. Uh, some people will just be motivated by that anger and feeling like if I don't get that revenge on them, then they're one up on me. And I, I can't let that happen. I can't let somebody be one up on me. I've, I've got to be one up on them. And, and maybe that's where some rumination or thing comes in as well too. So, um, yeah, the, I can understand the maladaptive daydreaming about revenge and, um, I, I, the, the event that's happened. I've, I've been there myself. I, I get it. I, I, a hundred percent feel for that. And I also know how much better my life is when I stopped being angry about it and, and thinking about revenge and just decided I'm just going to live my life and I'm going to have fun. And why am I letting that event get in the way of what's happening in my life now when I don't even see that person anymore, nor will I ever interact with that person again, right? That's just, that just won't, happen uh, as far as i can i mean i i can't say 100 percent guarantee like i i could never guarantee that i wouldn't run into them someplace when i'm out somewhere or something like that and i have thought about that once in a while and i've often thought what i would do and you know my initial urge is to make a fist and just to posture and 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 i think if they came up to me and i and and said anything but an apology i would say you know i I really have nothing to say to you unless you're ready to apologize for the fact that you beat me up and poured tear gas in my face when we were in grade school. And, and, uh, until then there, there's nothing else to say. No, there was another kid from grade school, uh, who we were at a class reunion and he came up to me and he, and he pulled me aside and, and he shook my hand and he said, you know, I probably wasn't always the nicest person in the world. And, and then he said, well, in fact, I know I wasn't. And, and I'm sorry about that. And um, he said, I, I know what you're doing as a career and I think it's great. And I'm, I'm proud of you. And I was like, cool, thanks. And, and anything from that kid is gone, right? I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm like, Hey, now if I see you on the street or something like that, I'll chat with you and, and, and have a good time. And, you know, grab a beer or whatever, you know, that, that would be totally cool just to, just to see what's up and what's going on. Uh, so I can allow for that forgiveness as well too. And I've probably rambled on too much about my own life here. So apologies to everybody about that. But, um, if, if I have an example like that, I, I, I hope that it's, I hope that it's helpful for some people to hear some of those things. Uh, Puddin Cake says, any advice for how to help three-year-olds with uh, generalized anxiety, maybe OCD too? Well, uh, Puddin Cakes, I would say, you know, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're, you're doing some potentially great ERP principles, right? Um, we know that ERP can start in people in, in very young, <laughs> ERP, I'm sorry. We know that OCD can start in, in people very young and that some people just seem to be born more on the anxiety side and, and other kids are born fearless, right? And just go do whatever. So uh, I think that it never hurts to uh, be a good model and guide to someone about what's a way to approach things that are frightening or scary in the world and to show someone that just because you have a fear of something doesn't mean it's bad or dangerous and that you can be a model of that as well too. So I hope that helps. Lisa T says, some of my OCDs have actually come true. I feel like I jinx myself to someone. Yeah, well, you know, Lisa, some of the thoughts I've had have come true too. Uh, I've told this story before, but once uh, there was a guy cutting down a tree in our backyard and it was the tree that I loved. And I was so mad that this guy was cutting down the tree. I was looking out the window of my house and I was thinking, I hope you fall out of the tree. And then the guy fell out of the tree. So Lisa, does that mean that I have abilities to make people fall out of trees or do coincidences happen once in a while? And sometimes even the things OCD throws on are are, are going to happen as well too, right? So notice that OCD would never say, oh, um, you know, I was wrong in that. OCD is going to say, oh, you, Lisa, didn't do enough rituals. So that's why it happened. I mean, I OCD accept no fault for anything whatsoever. It's always you. You're always the fault. I, I, And I wonder, we've got 96 people on here right now. I wonder if you could just put in the comment, do any of you who have OCD who are listening 
or any of you have a loved one who knows someone, has OCD ever once taken responsibility for something actually going wrong? Or has OCD only blamed you or other people or other things for why something would go wrong? Because OCD, I don't believe, would ever take responsibility for anything going anyway, but 100% perfectly. And since nothing ever does, uh, OCD doesn't take responsibility for anything. Although it does tell you all the time that it is the reason why you're safe and everything's okay is because of it, though we have no proof of that whatsoever. So that, it'll be fun to check the comments in a little bit and just see what people say. That. Joseph's with us from Idaho. Welcome, Joseph. Good to have you here. Uh, Jay Miguel says, I have obsessions without physical or mental compulsions. How to do ERP? Sometimes I think I should throw away something because it doesn't feel right and my mind is in this loop. Well, um, you know, that that is a mental compulsion, that thinking that you should potentially throw something away and, and um, you know, it could be an obsession. I mean, I, I would be interested in getting a little bit more there too. I mean, obviously I would want to know what the trigger is for something like that. The obsession might be that this is contaminated. The compulsion would be to think about throwing it away. So I would just want to know more in detail on that, but I could see in there that there would be obsessions and compulsions potentially. So, uh, Sonny says, can OCD obsessions focus on one person? I feel horrible. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it could be uh, fears of harming someone or pedophilic issues around someone or sexual orientation issues of attraction to someone. Absolutely. It can, it can hundred percent do that. Um, Miguel says how to stop uh, sexual orientation OCD for a straight man. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a straight man or a gay man, it would all be the same. It's, it's not about how to stop intrusive OCD thoughts. It's about to, how do you recognize that just because they're there doesn't mean that they have to mean anything whatsoever. Right. Um, you know, I, I can give no one a guarantee about their orientation and what it will be tomorrow, uh, versus what it is today. I, I can give nobody on this, on this call, 100% guarantee that tomorrow you won't change that, right? It's not about giving a guarantee to somebody that you will or won't be something or that you are or are not something. It's about helping people recognize that that if this thing is important to you, OCD is going to say, oh, now wait a minute, but what if, what if suddenly it changes? What if it's different? What if you're not that? What if you're lying? What if it's all in your head? What if it's not true? And, and blah, blah, blah. And my work with people is how to recognize that and to walk away from that and not give in to that. So that's where you'd really want to go with that. Maley Maid says, I'm currently going through PTSD and OCD, which we can definitely see happen because OCD being the opportunistic jerk that it is, will say somebody experienced potentially a trauma and then say, hey, I can make sure that never happens again. As long as you do these, uh, these compulsions here, that'll, that'll work out really well. My OCD theme has to do with my childhood trauma. Is the treatment the same for people who don't have trauma? Yes, we would still absolutely, uh, absolutely be doing uh, exposure and response prevention therapy. So, so that's what we would do. And for Stacy, same thing. If your OCD is ever feeling out of control, you know, ERP is the way to go. And those are the things that we need people to absolutely do. That's what, that's what we have to work on. Right. Howard asks, will we be adding more therapists in Tennessee? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Howard, that's the goal. In fact, uh, we're always hiring at no CD. So if you happen to know a good therapist and, uh, you know, you like the work they do, uh, maybe send them over to take a look at us over here at No CD, and let's see if we can do some stuff to bring them on. Uh, we would love to get, or if you you're, happen to be related to a therapist or know one, uh, we're, we're always looking for great therapists. So please feel free to send them our way. Okay. Audrey, do you have any advice for how to cope with intense OCD panic episodes and resist compulsions? I'm struggling a lot with relationship OCD and confessing, reassurance seeking, and compulsive urges to end things. Yes. Uh, so if those panic episodes are actual panic, like panic attack kinds of episodes, you would want to do something that we call interoceptive exposures, which is the treatment that we use for panic. And there are some people who uh, their OCD recognizes that panic is a big motivator, right? So what would happen is, let's say you're thinking about not doing a compulsion, right? You to, to decouple the obsession and compulsion from each other and hopefully to lessen the strength of the OCD. And then OCD is going to come in with, oh, 
that could be bad. What, you know, oh, how are you feeling about that? And then you might start scanning your body a bit. And then you're like, oh, crap. I don't like that feeling. That's awful. That's horrible. Oh, that's really, really uncomfortable. Why would I be feeling this? And then boom, panic attack or something of that nature. So interoceptive exposures are exposures that are designed to purposely expose you to the feelings that you might have physically during a panic attack. So we would do things like running in place and hyperventilating, breathing through straws, spinning in a chair, uh, holding your breath. And we teach people not to allow those sensations to be something that frightens them into doing safety seeking behaviors. And when you learn that you don't have to react to those kinds of sensations in such a way that you feel like they're dangerous or awful, horrible, or something bad's going to happen, you do start to feel better. Now, when you're struggling here with relationship OCD and you're confessing a lot and reassurance seeking and they have these urges, what I would encourage you to do, Audrey, and, and again, you know, I would work on this with a therapist because uh, I can't give you really therapy advice here. But one of the things that I would do in a similar situation, if you're in my office, is I would probably have your partner there too. And I would have your partner get a book and I would have your partner label that the worry journal. And anytime you, Audrey, asked your partner a question or sought reassurance about something, I'd have them write that down and I have them write down the answer. And if you ever brought it up again, Audrey, I'd, I would just have them say, that's in the book. We're not discussing that anymore. So that, Audrey, you stop going to them for reassurance and you have to provide it to yourself. And after a while, Audrey, you won't even go to the book anymore because you'll have memorized everything in it. And now you'll just have to be on your own with that and not getting that reassurance and recognizing that the confessing isn't helping any situation. You already know logically that the reassurance and the confessing aren't helping the situation whatsoever. They're probably only making it worse. And then when you start to feel like, well, maybe doing that made it worse, what are you going to do? You're going to confess more and you're going to seek more reassurance to make sure that it didn't. But then in doing that, you're going to see that maybe that made it feel worse again. So then you're going to go back to doing those things again. This is where the compulsion, which OCD is, says is the cure, is actually the thing that causes the problem. Uh, that's why no CD is is called no CD. It's no compulsive disorder, right? We want to get rid of those compulsions because those compulsions don't help the situation. They make it worse. Nicole asks, can hormones play a role or a part in severity of OCD? 100%. Absolutely, Nicole. And so we often uh, can see that can be in a perinatal kind of experience with a pregnancy or a birth that can be even monthly around the time of a period as well, too. So absolutely 100 percent hormones can play a role in OCD and the kind of up and down experience of OCD as well, too. Uh, let's see. Blake says, my OCD fixates on my marriage, specifically that I married the wrong person and I will be miserable forever. It ebbs and flows. But when it flows, my spouse has a real hard time. Not sure what to do. Well, Blake, definitely reach out to a therapist and hopefully one of us at OCD can be helpful to you. But if not us, get in touch with a therapist who can help you through this with ERP. They're the ones who are really going to walk you through how to deal with these types of things. And also, uh, as uh, give you a way to support your spouse as well, too, so that they know what's going on and can really understand this and not feel like these are real doubts and fears or something like that instead of this is the way that OCD has come through, right? Uh, again, for all of us, we know OCD loves to pick on things that we love and that we find important. So I hope that, um, Blake, you reach out to someone who could really help you with that. Alex says, given your experience helping people with OCD, what is the more common recovery time? You know, Alex, uh, we like to front load therapy here at NoCD. We found that to be the most helpful thing to do. And so we try to do a couple of sessions a week with people for the first several weeks of doing this. Uh, I would say, you know, you'd want to hit probably a good dose of therapy is probably going to be 13 to 15 sessions is what you would be really looking for. And so I would work toward that and trying to get it done quickly, you know, not spacing it out like doing a week and then waiting a couple of weeks and doing another session and then waiting a month and doing another session. But, you know, consistency is key in this as you're learning that OCD. So I hope that that can really motivate you to do that and be helpful to you. VA Girl says, thanks, Dr. McGrath, for being here each week. Well, happy to be here with you, VA Girl. It's so, so wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Uh, Victor says, hi, a girl is repeatedly in my mind every time I initiate a relationship with another girl. It's occurred uh, three times with the same girl and uh, girl one and girl two, it looks like. Well, Victor, um, 
just because somebody pops in your head doesn't mean that that has to ruin the current relationship that you're in. Although you may look at that and your OCD may say, oh, well, you wouldn't have this person popping into your head if uh, it didn't mean something, if, if uh, you know, if it didn't mean that you really like them instead. You're not with them anymore, so I'm going to go with the fact that there's probably a good reason for this. But OCD is doubt, right? And OCD will be like, well, did you leave them for the right reason or right purpose, though? Or, um, you know, should you have stayed with them? That kind of thing. And uh, could this person actually be better or cuter or anything else uh, versus, for, versus this this other person? Right. And, and, and so a lot of comparisons are going to go on. It's like, we haven't talked much about OCD comparison, actually, now that I think about it and doing this two years, but uh, the grass is always greener on the OC on the other side in the OCD world. Right. And, and once you have the fence, then the grass becomes greener on the side that you are on. Right. Uh, I've heard so many people say, Oh, this is the worst thing ever. And then a new thing comes up, but like, then that's the worst thing ever. And then suddenly the old one looks great. Right. When, when it was the worst thing that it could have ever been. So, Stacy says, I've washed the same load of clothes 10 times. Your hands are bleeding. Then Stacy, I'm going to go with what the ERP would be on that situation would be just because it feels like they're not clean doesn't mean it's true. And it would be best to now put some of those clothes on and wear them and feel the discomfort of that and allow yourself to be with the uncertainty of that. Uh, Sunny M comes up with, again, how to sit with uncertainty when it comes to obsessing. Um, in this case, Sunny M brings up POCD. How can I ever accept that things like that could be true? Sunny, it's, it, again, I can't guarantee anything to anybody, Sunny. So it's not about me trying to convince you that you are or aren't something. It's about recognizing that it's okay to have doubt about something, to not have a hundred percent answer or reassurance about something, right? Um, I, I can say to you this, I have no evidence of, of uh, running on anyone over with a car, right? I have no evidence of it whatsoever, but I can't give you a 100% guarantee that I've never done. It. I'd go with a 99.9999999999 and I'm cool with that, right? That's fine. Don't have OCD. Totally cool with that. OCD doesn't accept 99.9999999. OCD says only absolute 100% is acceptable. Uh, 100% only guarantee that I could not, have not, or will not ever do something. I can't give anybody that. Nobody lives in a world of that. And therefore, Sonny, all we're doing is trying to expose you to the world the way everybody else lives in it. You just have OCD that tells you that that's fine for everybody else and it's not fine for you. But Sonny, it is fine for you. And working with a therapist, they could really help you do that as well. Alex says, hey, Dr. McGrath, how do false memories form and why sometimes you can't even recall when certain false memories started? Um Alex, all you need is a little bit of doubt about something or maybe a discrepancy. Someone says one thing, but you think that it was another thing. And so that could be it right there. Uh, I, you may not remember why something uh, started, right? It, it could have been so amazingly small at the time that it's no big deal, but it's something that just built and built over time. And now you don't even know where it started, but you sure know, sure know where it's at, right? You don't have to know where something started, right, Alex? And it's not even as important really to know where they form or why they form or how they form. It's a recognition that just because we have something that we would call false memory OCD doesn't mean that my memory is right or correct about it. Um, I, I've given an example here. I remember the day my grandmother died, the phone rang and I answered the phone and I went into my mom and dad's room and I told my mom that my grandpa was on the phone. My mom remembers the, the day it happening of she ran, got up, got the phone, uh, ran back into her bedroom, got changed, and then ran out the door. Alex, which one of us is correct? I have my memory of it. She has her memory of it. And both of us think we're right. One of us is wrong because we can't both be right because we both have different memories of the same event. So, Alex, which one is correct? Frankly, I don't care, right? I have my memory of it. I'm going to go with it. That's what I think that it was. She has her memory of it. She's going to go with it. That's what she thinks it was. It's really not a huge deal, right? 
Now you may say though, Alex, oh, but this is a big deal, right? Because what if this had happened instead of what I remember this happening? Or or I think this is what happened, but but I can't be a hundred percent sure about it. And how can I survive or function with that and all those things? So Alec, it's all about remembering the key thing that we've all talked about here tonight, accepting uncertainty, living in doubt, accepting the fact that we will never have a guarantee, right? That is so very hard for people to accept, right? But it is also the truth. Just so you all know, I have no guarantee when I walk up the stairs tonight after I'm done with this broadcast, that I won't fall back down the stairs and crack my head open and get a concussion and bleed out and die. I have zero guarantee that that will not happen. Now, I don't think it's going to happen. And I am going to still go up the stairs, even though I've had that thought about it. Okay? So, so guess what? I have no guarantees in my own life that I will or will not be something, do something, catch something, contaminate something, or be contaminated by something. I have zero guarantees about any of those things whatsoever. And I'm also not going to go search for them either. And the reason I'm not going to search for them is I already know I'm not going to find them, right? I'm not going to find any guarantees about any of the things that I would love to have guarantees about because those guarantees do not exist, right? As much as it would be nice if we can find them, and as much as all of you would like to have them, and as much as your OCD lies to you and says to you, if you could just give me this guarantee, I'll go away. I'll leave you alone. I won't be a bother to you anymore. I totally promise. Just give me this one answer, this one guarantee. And hey, we're good. We're golden. That's all that we need. We just need that one thing. And even if you do give in and give it to it and do that compulsion, OCD is going to go, oh, thank you so much. That was great. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. Do, do, do. Oh, hey, hmm, hmm. wait a minute. That might not have been good enough. I'm wondering if you could just give maybe maybe just a little bit more than, than you gave already. I mean, that was that was really good, actually. It's just not just not quite enough. Just just not everything, right? Not the end all be all answer. So uh, I'm wondering if maybe I could I could just get that. So let's let's go search for that. Yeah, I, I know I know you got to go to work, and I know I know you got things to do, and everything. But but come on, for me, you know, this is what I really need. And then I promise I'll leave you alone. I'll go away. You just that's all that's all I need. I just I just need that answer. I just need that guarantee. Um, that's, that's it. No, nothing else. And I'll never be able to satisfy it. I'll never be able to give it, and it will never happen. Well, once again, you've spent an hour with me. Thank you so much. Reminder, no CD, a downloadable app. You get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out online at nocd.com. We have openings for teletherapy in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. And just a reminder, once again, uh, you can register at OCD SoCal for the OCD Southern California Conference. That's going to be on Saturday, April 30th from 9 to 6 PST next week. Chris Tronson, one of the awesome, awesome board members of OCD SoCal, is going to uh, join. And uh, so, so happy that he's going to be here with us again. And we'll uh, be answering your questions together. And we'll talk a little bit about the upcoming conference as well, too. But it's always good to have to have Chris come back and be on the show once again. So I want to thank all of you for being here always a joy. And 
make it a great week, everybody. Don't let that OCD be all pesky and get in the way of your life because uh, it sucks, right? And it's just a jackass and needs to go. So remember that. See you in a week.